My name is Peter Young, and I'm a member of the Committee 100, and I'm chair of this uh, Committee 100 Asian American uh, Career Ceilings Initiative. And I want to welcome you to what I think is it's a wonderful a panel and a wonderful topic on running for office. Uh, I'm, I'm going to speak briefly before I uh, introduce Gary Locke, who is the chair of the Committee 100, to make some welcoming comments. But just briefly, this is a program that started in February of 2020 uh, because there was a strong feeling that as successful as Asian Americans have been getting into you know, good schools and, and rising up in the middle ranks, that pretty much in every profession, uh, Asian Americans have difficulty getting beyond the middle ranks. And uh, so we've had a whole series of events and webcasts to, of experts who examine the problem and show the data, people who have in different professions and, uh, and, and explain what it's like uh, in that particular profession uh, and millennials who talk, who were who, a panel of millennials who talked about what it looked like from the perspective of millennials. And I hope this has been very, very helpful to those of you who are trying to manage your own careers and, uh, and, and be successful. But this one has a special meaning for me because I strongly believe that Asian Americans should have a greater participation in the political arena, whether it's running for office or appointed officer or supporting people who are running for office. So this is a very important one. So let me do this before I introduce uh, uh, our panelists and, and conduct the fireside chat. Let me turn it over to Gary Locke, who needs no introduction because he's well known by everyone. I, I, and uh, he was the uh, governor of the uh, state of Washington. He was the uh, secretary of commerce and he was the ambassador to, to China. So can't pick someone who has had more of an influence and more of an impact uh, on, the, on this country uh, and as an Asian American. So Gary, let me turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Peter. And it's really great uh, all that you're doing in terms of uh, these career initiative uh, uh, podcasts with such distinguished speakers. And you're right. Uh, there seems to be a glass ceiling in so many of our professions. And Asian Americans, Chinese Americans have given their blood, sweat, and tears for this country. Uh, you know, except for the Native Americans, we're all foreigners. And we've had wave after wave of newcomers and foreigners coming to this country whether we're first generation or 10th generation, whether our ancestors came on the Mayflower, a slave vessel or a steamer from Asia. Uh, it's been that constant infusion of ideas and creativity, cultures, language, religions that has really fueled the dynamism, the energy, the innovation that is America. And, but like so many groups, uh, Asian Americans have faced hardship and continue to face hardship. And I think the rise in the uh, tension between the United States and China is exacerbating that with all the incidents of anti-Asian hate, uh, the Kung flu virus, the Wuhan virus, the China virus, and just the, you know, the, the notion that Asian Americans are perpetual foreigners, which is why it's so important that if we care about the issues affecting our communities, whether it's public safety, whether it's job creation, whether it's the environment, whether it's safe communities, whether it's education, Asian Americans need to be at the table help setting the policies that affect all of us, especially since we have given our blood, sweat, and tears for this country. We have every right and indeed a responsibility to be at the table setting the policies that affect all of us. And I think, quite frankly, given our culture, our, our uh, immigrant experiences, um, we, we bring a different lens to the table. Uh, and it's that diversity of thought that, you know, it really makes our, our economy so vibrant, it makes that, that diversity of thought makes college discussion and debate uh, and analysis so much more vibrant. Uh, and the same thing at the, in the political arena, those different perspectives can actually improve the quality of the policies and the legislation uh, and the rules and procedures that are being promulgated and being considered. Uh, that's why, for instance, you have lobbyists representing senior citizens and, and all different walks of life as they look at legislation to say, hey, do you realize that it, it's going to impact my constituents, my interest groups, perhaps in a way that you never thought of? And so having Asian Americans at the table, um, uh, bringing those 
perspectives can improve the quality of policies coming out of city councils, school boards, state legislatures, and certainly the United States Congress. And when you look at um, uh, the huge population, the concentrations of Asian Americans in various communities and various states, uh, San Francisco has done a great job of electing Asian Americans to the city council. Uh, but you look at the population of New York or New York City, you look at other uh, population centers all across America with large concentrations, uh, large numbers of AAPI. I don't think we can say that our numbers in those political positions reflect the population. Uh, so, you know, uh, my, my advice to folks is that please get involved consider running for office. And it doesn't have to be for Congress. It doesn't have to be like for Attorney General of Connecticut or something like that, but it can be on the school board. It can be on the city council. And a lot of these positions are part-time and, and that will expose people to the opportunities ahead. And, and quite frankly, you don't need specialized training or a degree from a college or university. All that's required is care, commitment, interest, dedication, uh, to the policies of your own community and, and your constituent groups. And so, uh, in fact, having that background of whether you're engineer, author, dancer, writer, uh, uh, accountant, uh, educator, uh, lawyer, um, it can be very, very helpful. Uh, and so I really encourage people to consider running for office and be being involved in government, even on a board or a commission, lending your voice lending your thoughts, lending your perspectives on behalf of the AAPI community within your own communities. So with that, uh, I hope the listening to our great speakers and with the stimulating questions from Peter, uh, you'll understand that it's pretty easy to run for office, quite frankly. It doesn't require the backing of a huge mach uh, political machine. Uh, you can come out of left field as an independent uh, and, or a person who has never been involved in politics and you can win because I came out of nowhere, had no background, had no involvement in party politics before I ran for the state legislature. And then ultimately uh, the elected administrative officer for the metropolitan uh, Seattle area, and then ultimately governor of the state of Washington. And I wanna just say that without the support of AAPIs all across the United States who knew, who didn't even know me, but uh, took a chance on me and the voters uh, in my district took a chance on me. Uh, I am eternally grateful uh, for the support of the Asian American community from throughout the United States. And uh, everything I've tried to do was to make all of you proud, uh, to uh, establish myself as a credible, respected public official in order to make it, uh, to inspire others to run for office. And if I did a good enough job uh, to make it easier uh, for all candidates to actually win uh, win those offices. So good luck to all of you and enjoy the podcast. And I'll, I'll turn off my camera and sit back and listen. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, Gary. And by the way, for those, I think most of you know about the Committee 100, but for those who don't, uh, it was formed 33 years ago by f of, uh, a number of very prominent people, uh, I.M. Pei, Yo-Yo Ma, and, uh, and, and Oscar Tang, uh, and, and Henry Tang. Uh, for two missions. One, the domestic side, which is to help uh, Chinese Americans succeed in a positive, but also in a defensive way, but also to help improve uh, in a nonpartisan way, uh, U.S. and China relations. And clearly this program is part of the domestic uh, mission. Uh, before I start, I'd also want to give a special thanks for Henry Tang. Henry Tang is one of the founders of Committee 100, and he helped me recruit Alan Fung, and I guess I understand I should call it General Tong, right, as the Attorney General, uh, to be uh, to 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 be panelists for this. Uh, and I, I want to point out one thing that is in common for all three of the people, including uh, Gary Locke as a third, is that these are not people who ran for office in areas where there were high concentrations of Asian Americans. So it makes it particularly interesting that they were successful in being elected. Uh, in, in places where it wasn't because there was a lot of Asian Americans, which is a very important point. Uh, we also are bipartisan, so not counting Gary, we have one Democrat and one Republican. We decide we don't want to appear to be too skewed one way uh, or the other. So before I start, I just want to say Alan Fong uh, was, was the, uh, the mayor of Cranston, Rhode Island for 12 years, I guess it is, and uh, only 
stop because he termed out. But he is now running for Congress, so we want all of you to support him. Uh, General Tong is the Attorney General of, of, of Connecticut uh, and has had a, a terrific career in, in, in personal career in the political arena. So we're very, very pleased. Uh, he's not running for anything currently because he is Attorney General, so he doesn't have to run. But uh, uh, just re election. Just re election at some point which I'm sure will be a piece of cake. So let's start by, I'd like to start out and just ask each of you, uh, our two panelists, just take a few minutes and say, how did you decide to run for office initially, right? Because uh, uh, you weren't all born uh, you know, in politics. So at some point you made the decision to do that. So maybe if each of you, and maybe we'll start arbitrarily with you, Alan. Sure. You know, first of all, I do want to thank Committee for 100 for ha having not only this forum, but many of the forums to help, you know, many individuals break through that bamboo ceiling. You know, I also want to take a moment to thank uh, Ambassador Governor Locke, you know, for all that he's done, because he really was a trailblazer for many of us um, that really saw him as a role model doing what he did leading at a time where there wasn't many of us. Uh, out in public service like he did. So, you know, we owe a lot to, you know, Gary for what he has done. Uh, I'll be on the West Coast. But for me, you know, I was a uh, similar story to William because William and I have done many of these panels, you know, up and down the East Coast, all over the place. But we share a similar type background. You know, I'm first generation born in this country where my parents came over from Hong Kong uh, back in 1969. They went the Chinese restaurant route. I grew up in that restaurant. And the biggest thing that they stressed to me wasn't getting involved in politics. It was education. You know, I grew up working in that restaurant, learning about hard work, the ethics, what it takes to run a small business, but ultimately, you know, chose a career path of law and wanted to get involved. I studied political science in college as a pathway to law school, but I really enjoyed politics in a sense that I was always helping friends that ran for office uh, back in the day, you know, on, volunteering on campaigns, door knocking, phone banking, and really enjoyed that. But my goal at that time was to be a lawyer and help people advocate for many individuals as that lawyer. I kind of fell into politics back in early 2000, because while I was part of a um, law practice, doing what I was doing, enjoying, you know, the uh, career that I was building upon myself, Cranston, a city which was home to my family, home to my family's restaurant for 35 years during the height of the economy, uh, was really, really in dire financial shape. It had the dubious distinction of being in junk bond status with the worst bond rating of any city in the country. And when I started taking a look at what was going on, attending meetings, looking at the budget, I started to get angry, angry with some of the people that I even helped get elected and wondering how they could make some of these decisions that they were making. So I made that personal decision. I was either gonna sit back and just you know complain about it or get involved. And I decided at that time, as the governor noted, you can get involved by running for office and I did for a seat on the city council and you know, won that seat that first time, a citywide seat and no regrets because it's led to the career that I had where 12 years as mayor, we really improved the city's bond rating to its height, did a lot of dramatic reforms uh, to the pension system to help you know, stabilize it. But most importantly, turn it from that fiscal distress into one of the top 50 cities to live in America for three straight years. And that was just out of that motivation for anger. So not everyone gets involved, as the governor is saying, and you have different paths to move up. But that's how I kind of got involved. There was a little bit of motivation of anger, but anger against some of the people that I supported. But, you know, I have got no regrets and loved every minute of turning the city around. That's fantastic. So, General. No, or your story, your thank story. Thank you, Peter. Uh, you can be sure my mom doesn't call me that. Um, <laughs> uh, but it's, you it's great. To, you should. It's, <laughs> uh, it's great to be with you. And, and thank you, Henry, uh, for helping to recruit me and Alan um, to join today's panel. And thank you, C100. 
um, for hosting this important discussion. It's great to be with my longtime friend, Alan Fung. We met at a training, you know, 10, 15 years ago in Washington, DC. And Governor Locke has been um, a mentor to all of us, including me. Um, he's been gracious with his advice over the years when I considered running for federal office. Uh, many years ago, um, he sat with me and um, gave me a lot of, of great advice and guidance. So we wouldn't be here without Gary um, and his mentorship and his guidance. And, and we wouldn't be here without each other, honestly. Um, um, Alan's been a great support and, and I hope I have been to him as well. So uh, Alan and I largely come from the same place, almost exactly the same place, um, Chinese restaurants in New England. Um, my parents came here separately. They met in Bloomfield, Connecticut in a Chinese restaurant called the Hong Kong Kitchen. And they um, got together, got married, they opened their own place. And um, our experience is largely the same time frame. Um, I grew up working side by side with my parents in our Chinese restaurant. And as I got older, you know, sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, I was working there nights and weekends. My parents were there seven days a week, 15 hours a day. Um, so many people on this Zoom know this story. They know this experience. Um, I like to joke to my Chinese friends that you know, I can probably cook most things on a standard Chinese restaurant menu with a blindfold on um, and, and maybe someday Alan you and I can can see if we can still do it um, but a lot happened in that kitchen in that restaurant and for me um, you know being the son of immigrants first generation being the first American in my family um, you know my parents uh, did not become citizens until after I was born there's obviously a, a feeling of being out of place, um, a feeling that you don't belong, but it's really, you really feel it when you're in a kitchen on a Friday night. And I remember packing takeout orders, you know, ladling the wonton soup into containers and packing the duck sauce and the soy sauce and the fortune cookies. And I would walk by this door that had a diamond window in it. And I would walk by it a hundred times a night. And that door was the door in and out of the kitchen. And I would look through that window and you could see in the dining room, all the people that were enjoying, you know, Friday night dinner at my parents' place. But we in the kitchen were invisible to them, right? I mean, it, it was a very real, not just a figurative, but a very real barrier. And I was always aware of it as a kid. And I always felt like, I needed to do the best I could to get through that door, right? Literally get out of that kitchen into the dining room and, and, and literally get a seat at the table. Um, and so I think that's honestly that feeling of being out of place, that, that feeling of not belonging, that feeling that is really accentuated in a hot Chinese restaurant kitchen on a Friday night when you're 11, 12, 13 years old, that, that made a huge impact on me. And I, and I think that motivated me um, to run for office. Let me fast forward to now because Gary talked about all the reasons why it's important that we get a seat at the table. But I think sometimes we say that so much that we should be full partners in the democratic experiment, that we should have a seat at the table, that our voice needs to be heard. And, and sometimes we say it so much, I worry that it loses meaning and, and we don't quite understand why it's important that Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, and in particular Chinese Americans, really participate, and why diversity and our representation is important. Why does representation matter? And, and I think it's become so clear in the last couple of years. It's because of moments like right now, when literally Chinese Americans in major cities, including New York City next door to me, including places in Connecticut, Chinese Americans have a target on our backs. We're literally being assaulted in the streets and on subways. And who's going to speak up for us if there is nobody in a position to do so that will be heard, right? In a position of authority to do something about it. You got Michelle Wu as, as the mayor of Boston. That is a huge step forward for our community confronting this hate. You know, I call the national convening 
of attorneys general using um, the Attorney General Alliance as a platform we call the National Convening Against Anti-Asian Hate. That wouldn't have happened if I weren't Attorney General. Um, and that's why it's so important that, that people like Alan and people like uh, Gary, maybe we'll convince Gary to run again, um, and, and people like Grace Mung and, and uh, others across the country, Michelle Wu, we need people like them in positions of authority and influence where that it can, they can actually do something, uh, particularly in moments like this, to protect our community and to make sure that, that we're cared for, that law enforcement focuses on protecting our community and people in our community. My next question is one that's it's kind of a complex question. It's difficult to, to, to answer, which is, um, why is it, do you think, the two of you think, uh, that, that uh, Asian Americans are underrepresented. And I know it's a complicated thing because it's not just dis discrimination. It's not just, a, it's a whole bunch of things. So by the way, uh, you know, the two of you are Democrat Republican. So now since you both grew up with Chinese restaurants, you, you, don't, you don't reach across the aisle, you reach, reach across, you know, the, the kitchen table, right? <laughs> to, Lazy to reach Susan. Out to you, right. So why, what's your own personal view as to why it's, uh, you know, uh, Asian Americans are underrepresented in, in all these different, you know, pockets of politics? And I'll let whoever wishes to speak first, I'll, 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 you know, please speak. Uh, I guess, I guess I'll, I'll go. Um, we could talk about this question for hours and, and let's set aside the obvious uh, racism stereotypes, right? The we're allegedly not leaders, right? Um, that we are not vocal, um, that we're too recent as immigrants. It, you know, um, uh, obviously China bashing, xenophobia, um, fear of Chinese Americans, um, all of that scapegoating. Let's put that to the side because that's easy to identify. I, I think, sometimes we have trouble as a community getting out of our own way. And, and we talk about empowering Asian Americans uh, and Pacific Islanders in, in the political system and the democratic process. I don't think that we all understand what it takes. And, and, and maybe that's because people come from different political um, uh, traditions. And, and when you come here as immigrants, you have to learn American democracy. I think that's also an, an easy excuse because so does everybody else. But I, I think that, you know, for people like me and Alan and Gary, this is a long slog. You know, you start in a, on a local board of education, you start as a volunteer. Um, I started in this as a, as a commissioner on a local commission Then I ran for the state legislature. And um, I've had a lot of ups and downs. I've had, more wins than losses, but I've I've lost a good amount, and and um, and I think people expect, frankly, that uh, unless you're running for president, um, it's not really worth engaging, and and that's the wrong approach. And and I think there are other communities, other communities, frankly, that have done more faster um, than than this community. Um, I'll be very candid. The South Asian community has been very successful in a very short period of time. Um, and, and I think it's because uh, we as a community, A, we think maybe that we don't rock the boat ourselves, right? We buy these stereotypes that we're not leaders. Two, that it's not a worthwhile enterprise. And three, that we don't make the investments that it takes to go from being a school board member or a local volunteer all the way up. That takes decades. Um, it does. It doesn't just happen overnight. And I think I think some people in our community think, well, let us know when you're a United States senator or a governor, um, because um, we don't have time, you know, for the for the first few rungs of the ladder. Alan, your view. Um, by the way, uh, that's an interesting point of view, General, because in fact, it's so easy to blame other people for things. Yeah, and, and there's a tendency not to be honest about maybe some of the things that are self-created barriers and so forth. Alan, your your uh, your comment? Yeah, actually, 
You know, I want to supplement a lot of what William said, because it's absolutely true, but I want to take it home a little bit uh, even more to that personal level, because, you know, as I was recounting that story about me wanting to get involved in politics uh, way back when, when I first jumped into that council race, and, you know, I'm sure William and the governors had this discussion with many candidates that approached them. When you first jump in, the most important thing is to make sure that you have the support and buy-in of your family because they're part of that campaign as well. And I remember that first conversation I had with my mom. And remember, she was born, you know, in China, came over from Hong Kong. I was a successful lawyer, actually working as the head of government relations for MetLife, uh, you know, for their property casualty company. And I remember my mom looking at me and goes, wait a minute you just spent all this money becoming a lawyer. You got a great job. Why would you want to go into politics at this time and, you know, be subjected to all that yelling, screaming? It's not going to be easy. You know, you're my son. Why would you want to put yourself through that? And, you know, it's the protective mom in her. But, you know, this is something I felt passionate about doing, wanting to do, putting my skills to the test. And, you know, it worked, it was successful. Not every campaign's easy because, you know, we and I, uh, like we, you know, kicked off this, talked about uh, when we kicked it off, our, de- our districts, our demographics within this, uh, our population here isn't heavily Asian American, never mind Chinese American. So it's not like we're coming from San Francisco. So there is a lot of work, a lot of effort, but, you know, when you're successful, and you can you know, break that initial barrier. And I was proud to be the first Asian American elected in Rhode Island, but you know, that can't stop there. We've got to overcome a lot of those mindsets that my mom had, because what's funny about it to this day, I'll go over for Sunday dinner, so I still got to go take care of mom and have Sunday dinner with her. But when I do, she's asking me questions like, oh, I saw you on this channel. And I'm like, this is a cable access channel watching the city council meeting or watching, you know, me on this channel. I'm like, wait a minute, for the woman that was very fearful of her son jumping into politics, now you can't get her away from the television trying to find out what's going on. A lot of it is also overcoming that initial fear and hurdle within your family, getting that support, because that is critically important because you're going to have to have that initial foundation to move forward because William's right. I've been in the same boat that William's in, and I'm sure the governor too, where sometimes those challenges, you hit road bumps, but if you have the strong foundational support system and you continue building it up, that's how you continue to succeed and not let, you know, those barriers, you know, be too much that you can't overcome and just keep trying because it's tough to be the first, but once that first is broken and that ceiling, bamboo ceiling has been kicked open, you know, I want to see, just like William and the governor, more candidates coming in, more people getting involved, because this is truly public service. And if you're not at the table, you're going to be the dinner and you don't ever want to be in that role. Yeah. By the way, uh, Alan, what did, Alan just... what did you what did you tell your mom when she said, why are you doing this? And, and how long did it take her to forgive you? Five years, <laughs> 10 years, 12 years? <laughs> no, it worked out. But fortunately, my dad was very supportive, talked her off the ledge about, you know, getting involved because he saw coming over that there was a need, a role that, uh, to be filled. And he also knew I had a big mouth and was always willing to be an advocate. And that's what we have to be. Yeah. And I don't, you know, that's why we're here in a bipartisan manner to encourage others, you know, to not be afraid to, you know, be that voice for others because we need it more so than ever now. By the way, it took, so I, it took my parents yeah. three years to forgive me for not going to medical school. So it took a while, but they, they eventually, you know, got over it. Uh, William? Well, that was never in the cards for me. I wasn't good enough at the math and the science, but I, uh, I wanted to, to do Alan one better. So when I was in the legislature, I was chairman of the Judiciary Committee and our hearings would be broadcast on our local cable you know, Connecticut version of C-SPAN. And so when you're a legislator, you can't always stay in one hearing. You might have three hearings going on at the same time, even if you're the chairman. So I would leave to go to another hearing 
and, and I might go get lunch, you know, or go have a meeting and I would get a text message from my mother and she would say, you've been gone too long. Your chair has been empty. <laughs> go back to your, your chair. You have to chair that meeting. <laughs> now, Thanks, my, next, my next question is actually, an, it's a kind of a subtle question in a sense. Now, both of you um, have a history of running for office where you had to get voters to vote for you and so forth. But, uh, you know, there's a, whole, there's a whole list of jobs at different levels where you're appointed. So, and I know you have lots of friends, you know, who have been appointed to different, uh, different positions. Uh, and uh, Gary Bach was appointed to be a Commerce Secretary. He wasn't elected to that. Uh, what's the difference? And it was, how does it feel different? How is it different in terms of the experience or, or what it's like so forth to be appointed as an Asian American versus running for office uh, in an elected office. Alan, do you have a, a view? Yeah, sure, absolutely. No matter how you get involved, whether it's through an appointment, running for office, or even just supporting candidates, it's important to get involved because if you're there supporting someone ideolo you know, from an ideological perspective um, aligns with you or sitting on an important board of commission, like the governor uh, indicated, we're always looking for good people that bring a fresh, diverse perspective to the table. You know, before I was elected mayor, you know, our former governor had appointed me as chairman of our governor's insurance council. You know, in that role, I was sitting there making sure that as an industry, we're providing appropriate advice, you know, to the governor about the financial services industry within the state and how we can continue to uh, improve the jobs and economy within Rhode Island. So there are different ways that you can use your background and talents, whether it's through an appointment, you know, to an important border commission, to a position, you know, certainly when the, um, you know, the ambassador, when he was in that role as ambassador, you know, to China, you know, that's critically important, but there's a lot of different ways to serve. And I encourage people, no matter what role that you're in, what comfort level too, is also plays an important part of it because sometimes, you know, running for office isn't for everyone, because but there are different other ways to kind of get involved. General, you need uh, to uh, office, I, pros and cons. I have to agree with Alan, it's not for everyone. Um, and so while we both encourage people to run for office and, and engage in that way, um, you know, you have to want to do it and it takes a lot of sacrifice um, the pay is not very good. Uh, and, um, you know, there's a lot of scrutiny and criticism, a lot of it unfair. Um, I still routinely um, check my Twitter feed, um, receive unwarranted racist, hateful attacks because I'm a Chinese American and, and nobody signs up for that, but nobody is surprised either that, that, that I get that. So running for office, raising money, you know, you know, knocking doors, making speeches, doing debates, that's not for everybody, but it is critical. And, and um, you know, appointed positions are incredibly important and, and in many ways just as important. And, and Governor Locke has done both. But I think Governor Locke would agree that probably his, some of his most consequential service was when he was in charge and when he was able to set the agenda. And, and as a governor, um, he was able to do that unlike any other person in the state of Washington. And um, I, I think that that's a huge distinction. And if you run for office, particularly executive office, you will have the opportunities to set an agenda in a way that someone who's appointed or frankly, who is a legislator will not have the ability to set an agenda. Um, and if you really care about advancing, not just the interests of Asian Americans and Pacific Islanders, but the interests that we share with other people, right? Um, and, and that includes economic justice, right? Opportunity, um, um, uh, law enforcement support, uh, all of that, um, investments in education, all of those priorities that we all share, you can really only do that when you're in an elected position and you can set the agenda. Now, uh, General, you, you sort of may have peaked at the next question because you started to get into it, which is 
uh, you know, what are the candid pros and cons of being in public office? Now, this is very important because I know you had a lot of positive things and, and, and if you didn't like what you were doing, you wouldn't have done it. But to be fair to the audience, I think it's important for them to see both sides of, of the yeah. coin uh, because you, 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 you know, you, you want to make sure, you know, <clears throat> when I hire people, one of the things I always say is my goal is that after you work for a month, there are no surprises, either positive or negative. In other words, you, you really felt that you got an even information, both sides about it. So if you looked at that ledger and said, what are the, you know, what are the candid pros and, con and cons about being in, in, in political office that you would want someone to have told you or you want the, the audience want to know in making their own decision, right? About, uh, about whether to get into you know, political office. What would those be? Well, the, the pros are obviously, um, well, maybe it's not obvious, but you, you can do extraordinary things for people. Um, and, and so just in the past year, you know, I was able to play a central role um, in the settlement negotiations with Purdue Pharma and the Sackler family and to produce a $6 billion national settlement and to cause the Sacklers to sit there while victims and survivors told them directly how they've destroyed their lives and impacted their communities. Um, it is incredibly gratifying um, personally and rewarding, but also impactful to the families in Connecticut that I served, that I was able to do that. You know, I've been um, involved in landmark gun anti-gun violence legislation, for example, in Connecticut. And I know that that saved lives. And I can't do that um, candidly as a lawyer in private practice. Um, you know, those are the pros. The cons, I, I've already I've already talked about the cons, you know, money, <laughs> um, criticism, uh, fair and unfair scrutiny, sacrifice, time away from family and children and 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 my wife and my family. But let, let me just say something though. I think that I think those sacrifices are overstated. And I remember having a, a conversation with a Filipino American doctor who said, William, I don't know how you do it. You know, how do you do with all the backbiting and the scheming and the backstabbing and the politicking? And I said, what do you mean? He's like, well, I just couldn't do it. You know, that's why I'm not in politics. And I said, doctor, don't you work in a hospital? And he said, well, yeah. And I said, I can't think of a more political place than a hospital, <laughs> you know, oh, or an investment bank or a law firm, right? Or an insurance company. And the truth is, if I wasn't doing this, sure, I'd be making a heck of a lot more money, maybe at a partner, you know, at a major law firm in New York, you know, God willing. But the truth is, that would also be hard. You know, I'd still be billing 3000 hours a year. And, you know, when the run up to partner, I wouldn't see my kids and you have to, you know, bring in business and you have to, you know, there's a political game, you know, in a big institution like that or a partnership about, you know, who's in power and who's not in power. So, so you know, I, I think in any profession in which you're trying to be successful, make an impact and be a leader, it's going to be hard. Okay. Alan? You know, but a lot of the hard is outweighed by the good that you can do. You know, William talked about some of the examples and even with me taking you know, our second largest city from that financial, almost near bankruptcy state to one of the top 50 cities to live in America. And you see that transformation of building up, you know, the city, uh, working with developers as you change that landscape, working to solidify the city's finance, stabilizing our police officer and firefighters pension plan. That good really outweighs the hard. But let's not be kidful because there are a lot of hearts that are thrown and obstacles thrown in front of you, especially if you're, you know, Asian American, Chinese American, because there are a lot of stereotypes that still get thrown at you. In fact, I'm just thinking back to all my first race premiere. I'll never forget the uh, local Cranston paper 
on the weekend just before the election, they made a joke. It misfired badly, but the headline read, oh, voters have a choice. Uh, will they go for Italian or Chinese? Boiling down you know, the two candidates for, um, for you know, the mayoral office, basically into food choices. And, you know, you sit there going, really? But fast forward that, you know, to 20 years later, when I'm one of my runs for governor, you know, an individual didn't like one of the policy decisions that I was putting out there, decides to take my lawn sign, put it around a noose and hang it from a tree outside in his front yard where a lot of the neighborhood kids were going by every single day. And whether he knew or not about the symbolism of a new, especially for Chinese Americans, African Americans throughout history, you know, that's some of the stuff that you will encounter, um, you know, depending at the levels. It's not like that at all levels, but that is some of the hard realities that I face. And I know William has faced that because, you know, we're friends. We've talked about a lot of this stuff or even governing. When you're governing, you know, I had someone because I was making difficult decisions. And when you get into office and you're on the verge of bankruptcy, you have to make tough decisions. 4 a.m., someone drove to my house, you know, knocked out the storm window on my door and took off. You know, you're seeing Michelle go through that in Boston, where daily, you know, they're picketing outside of her home. You know, right now in this day and age, it's, you know, we all live in a world where technology is wonderful. But it's also an inhibitor, too, because, you know, it's easy for many individuals to be keyboard warriors anonymously. And, you know, you're putting yourself out there, not just in policy that you when you're governing, but when you're running for office. That's a lot to think about. But one of the things I do want to encourage people, because William, you know, and the governor, you know, can attest to it, too. It's not easy. But when you get in there. You're the one setting the agenda. You're the one setting the policy. You're the one being the advocate, not just for the policies you believe in, but for your community. And you can better so much of not only your backyard, the state, the country, or even the globe. But it's, it sounds like, though, really each person has to take a hard look at themselves and say, what's the ledger look for, for me? If you don't have a passion for helping other people and so forth, then the plus is not as big a plus. If you're very sensitive about people doing nasty things and so forth, the con could be greater for you than for someone else. So I, I, I think you're right about the pros and cons, but the most important thing for all of you who are, you know, who are watching is take a look at yourself and be honest about what, what you're like, right? And what's important to you and what you can tolerate. Uh, and if you're a super private person, well, even if you really want to help the community, you know, maybe being a politician is not a good thing. The next question is kind of an interesting question because I don't think it's asked very often. And that is, <clears throat> you know, the, the, to, to, to get elected office, you've got to run, right? You got to run, you get in the skills and the task and the experience of running for office and raising money and meeting with people and so forth. And then there's being in office, right? Uh, which is a totally uh, different experience, right? So for the two of you, one, uh, when you were running and as you, you know, as you uh, had different offices, make that distinction, which is the skills and the, and the experience of running versus being in office. And to what extent, how did you get the knowledge and the training to be effective in office, right? Because I got to tell you, being a lawyer in a law firm doesn't necessarily prepare you for being mayor of Cranston, Rhode Island, or being attorney general, right? It's a different kind of job. So that movement from running for office to being in office, what were the things that helped you figure out how to be effective? And what was really different about you know, that transition? Well, you know, for me, a lot of just our life experiences that we've gone through, William knows the drill, you know, growing up in that Chinese restaurant, you have learned the value of hard work and not being afraid to, you know, roll up your sleeves to do any jobs within that restaurant. And that's the same can-do attitude that I take, you know, in that role as mayor, because 
it's difficult sometimes and you have to learn to make sure that you get good advice you know when we kicked off we're you know uh, we were talking about mentors and people surrounding yourself with good people that could be a good sounding board because you don't want individuals that are just yes people yeah you're doing the best thing you know so making sure that you have a good core group of people with you you know as you're governing especially in areas that might not be within you know your area of expertise you know, I, I, there's a reason I chose the law. You know, I'm, I just like William, I wasn't good at, uh, you know, engineering and, you know, I, I I was horrible with geometry, you know, but when you get in there as mayor and you're, you know, dealing with public works issue, you better make sure you have a solid public works director that's a PE that can fill you in. You know, so there are difference, you know, differences between making sure that you know, that role that you have, having the right resources around you to help complement the decision making you're doing, having a good mentor, CEO type. And I've got a great friend who's the CEO of Old Sturbridge Village out in Massachusetts. He and I, you know, bounce things back and forth, the good and the bad. But it's also different because you're you're still, in a sense, while you're governing, also thinking about the campaign cycle, too, because that's always there. That's always part of you know that life too, because in order to be able to govern for a longer period of time, you're going to have to get reelected. So it all comes together, but most importantly, at all levels, you have to have the right team around you, right resources, and not just yes people. Yeah, you know, in fact, when I when I think across many of these webcasts that we've had over the last two years, probably one of the most common thing that's been mentioned is the importance of having a mentor, and and that if you don't one, you don't have someone who can help you succeed and help you be connected to the right people. But the other was you don't have access to knowledge that otherwise, you know, someone's had from having already been through the experience. So I'm glad you mentioned that, Alan, because that's very important. And actually, Asian Americans generally don't think of mentors the same way that other ethnic groups do, right? And and it's 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 very, very important. So General, your 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 view on on this thing about the transition to actually, you know, governing, you know, what was uh, it like and, and how did you make it work? I, I couldn't agree more about mentoring and maybe we could talk about that a little bit more, but, um, you know, obviously when you run for your first office, um, um, you're basing your knowledge and experience on your private sector experience. And uh, I'm a huge believer first of all, in cumulative experience and making sure that you at every step along the way, know you're learning and developing, right? And focus on what you've learned. So before I went to the legislature as a lawyer, I had developed skills and I was very conscious of it, developed skills of being on my feet. I was, you know, I was effective with clients um, and I was, I was, I was also effective at advocating for myself. And that's what a campaign is. It's advocating for yourself. And there's one thing, one stereotype that Asian Americans, in particular Chinese Americans, maybe we fall into is that we, we don't advocate for ourselves. And, and, and there are a lot of reasons for that. We could talk about that for hours, but, but you know, being an effective campaigner is being able to say why I'm good and why you should choose me. And, and you don't have to run for office to, to need to master that skill. If you want a job in a hospital or an investment bank or the university, you want to be a professor, you got to advocate for yourself. Once I got into office, um, you know, it really became cumulative. My, my experience as a legislator taught me about all of state government, all the different nooks and crannies, how the process works, then I became chairman of the banking committee and then chairman of the judiciary committee where I had oversight for our state's legal system. So you pull that all together, you know, after 12 years, I had been trained to be the chief legal officer of the state of Connecticut. Um, and it was only because I'd had that cumulative experience of being in legislature, of chairing those committees, of being a lawyer in private practice, that I was able to put that all together. And by the time I ran for AG, I was ready. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, maybe I would have run for it sooner if I'd had an opportunity, but I wouldn't be as, I wouldn't have been as ready as I was then. <laughs> Excuse me. By the way, I want to tell you a short story. I'm actually really surprised 
that the two of you didn't say that the key to your success was your experience in the family restaurant. Well, and, we uh, already said that. You know, we already and, said uh, that. and uh, I'll tell you, it's a very short story and it's a committee 100 story. Uh, I was co-chair of the New York uh, annual meeting in gala in 2019. And one of our speakers was Bill McDermott, who at that time was the CEO, CEO of SAP, huge software company, global, whatever. And someone asked a question, said, oh, you know, when you grew up, your family had a deli. And as a joke said, what skills did you have you from your experience with your family deli, did you transfer to becoming a successful CEO of SAP? He then spent 10 minutes explaining all the things that he learned while he was working at the deli that helped him become CEO of SAP. So uh, I, I, which kind of surprised the person who asked the question because they thought of it as a little bit as a joke, but I suspect that's true, right? Uh, it's not a joke. And if I may, this is a really important point. One of the stereotypes that angers me the most um, is that uh, we're not leaders, we don't rock the boat, um, that we're not uh, aggressive, we're not tough, right? And, I, you know, when you grow up watching your parents go seven days a week, 15 hours a day, pounding the rock every single day, no fear. They came to this country, my dad had 57 cents in his pocket when he got off the Greyhound bus. Like they didn't have time to think about whether they were leaders or not, or whether they were going to rock the boat. They just had to make it happen. Mm -hmm. And they did. And, and that's the most valuable lesson I, I learned from that restaurant, which is, you know, don't tell me we're quiet or meek or, you know, uh, afraid to stick up for ourselves or we don't rock the boat. I watched my parents do it for you know, years and years in that restaurant. And, and that inspires me to this day. Yeah. Alan, your same, comment? Same here, because that restaurant that, you know, I was a part of, same story, seven days a week. The only time that my parents closed was, you know, Christmas and Thanksgiving. But, you know, it, it's the same type of inspirational story that we all share, because whether it's the restaurant, laundry, or whatever, you know, industry our parents came, many of them, you know, really came here with nothing but, you know, the opportunity that was presented that they chose and that they worked hard to, you know, overcome. And they did it in their own way. Because William's right, it is so frustrating right now, not just in public service, but in many industries, you know, the stereotypes that are used against us. I've heard it, and I know William's heard it because you know, two of us talk, when we're on that campaign trail, oh, he's not aggressive enough. Oh, he's not this, he's not that. I can tell you, I'm a fighter. And I know William is too. We will stand up for what is right, but we just do it in our own way. You know, I've gotten more success, you know, um, during the 12 years as mayor, doing it my way, you know, sitting across the table, hammering things out, you know, with facts, with data, you know, and that, a lot of that is the experience we had in the restaurant where you're dealing with customer service, dealing with people on a daily basis, dealing with money on a daily basis. Those are those life skills and values that are instilled in you from day one that translate to not only just public service, but any job, any career that you uh, choose. So the last question I have for our, um, our two panelists is, as you, I'm sure you know what resources are available, whether it's nonprofits or training things and so forth uh, that, that, are, that are helpful to Asian Americans. Uh, are there any that you would like to just cite that, that, that uh, the audience should be aware of, uh, the resources that are, you know, that, that might be available uh, to help them either run for office or uh, succeed? One I'd like to throw out, there are a lot of great organizations out there. And that's how William and I met. You know, William talked about 15, almost over 15 years ago, we sat on a panel. I think it might have been for APAX. Or, it was APAX. Or, or, APAX. Oh, yes, um, APAX, right. Yeah, so, you know, it was a training. And that's, you know, one of the organizations. But there are a lot more out there you know, that can help develop leaders, whether it's a national organization like APACS 
or you know, uh, in the legal field, there's KPAL or other organizations that are helping try to get the next generation of leaders trained so that they know what they're getting into. But for me, I think there needs to be even more. One of the things that I'm seeing that I find as a lack of resources is a continuous network, like an organization that brings forward all the networks from that can help out candidates, especially you know, that look like us, come together for financial resources, for you know, help on media, help on you know, getting even just the simple basics of your campaign up and running. You know, we I think we're that's the one thing I'd like to see you know, us develop nationwide. Yeah, that's, that's elusive um, in, in other communities do it better. Uh, and I, so I agree with Alan. I, I think just to go back to the mentoring point, um, it's really important to um, develop a relationship with a local mentor who um, has the type of experience that can help you if you want to serve, if you want to take a particular route, either as an appointed or an elected. And except for Gary and Secretary Mineta, you know, there are very few mentors that look like us. And so most of my immediate mentors in my state are white males. Um, and um, I was very fortunate to have a number of mentors who um, invested in me, protected me, created opportunities for me. Um, I think I, I don't know if intentionally or not understood that it's a two-way street, right? It's not just right. what can you do for me, Mr. Mentor? Yeah. yeah. It's, you know, it is a relationship where you give as much as you take. But I was very lucky that um, the mayor of Stanford, Connecticut became my mentor and then he became the governor. And, you know, it's been a really helpful relationship for a very long time. Yeah, and in fact, that's an important point that you're making, which is the mentors don't, don't have to be Asian American, right? No. In fact, if you just said, I only want a mentor who's Asian American, you won't, won't have a long list of people to, no. to, to choose from. But I do, I do wanna just end with, uh, uh, with one comment about what what's Committee 100 is, is trying to do. Uh, last July, we had a, um, and I will ask Gary to make a closing comments, which, uh, your perfect timing on turning your, your video back on. But uh, last July, we did something unusual, which was we got all these people together, leaders from Ascent, from Leap, from all so forth, and a lot of the people who had been attendees of these events and, and younger people. And we got them together in a virtual ballroom. And we, we, the title of the event was, What Can We Do Better? And the mission was to come up with ideas of things uh, a list of things that we can do that are action oriented that would improve the situation with regard to the career ceilings. And out of that, we came 25 ideas. And by the way, we had discussion groups and discussion leaders at each table, and they had to come back to the podium with two or three ideas from their table. We ended up with 25 really terrific ideas of things that are, are actionable. And one of them came from May Lee Tom, who's a Committee 100 member, who said, look, and her table agreed, look, in California, you know, she helped to start this training program for candidates who are running for office who are Asian American, and then to help them be successful once they're elected. But as, you know, the general said, uh, the, a lot of other groups have national organizations, other ethnic groups, but the Asian Americans don't. So one of the ideas is how do we create some training things and, 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 and programs. Uh, and this is something that Committee 100 could do with, in collaboration with other people that, that help, that are resources to people who are thinking about running for office anywhere, you know, anywhere in this country. And that's one of the things on our list that we're going to try to do. I'm gonna turn it over to Gary for the, to have the last word and the closing comment. Well, I, I just wanna thank Peter again for hosting this, uh, 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 career ceilings uh, series of podcasts and just really fascinating topics and really great speakers. And I'm really, really, I, I was just so um, inspired to hear from Alan and William in, in terms of their own career paths and their common, common intersections as well. Uh, I wish that uh, when I was running for office, there were more Asian Americans uh, in elected positions throughout the United States that I could have turned to 
And I'm just glad that uh, Normanetta and so many other people were role models for me and, and provided advice, um, you know, uh, um, uh, uh, Congressman Matsui and obviously Senator uh, Inouye uh, from Hawaii. Those are all inspirations. Um, I just wanna echo what, what both Alan and William have indicated, just getting involved. Uh, each community is different and different boards and commissions. And I noticed from some of the questions, you know, what type of boards and commissions should people uh, join? Well, join one that is of interest to you. I mean, that's the best thing. I mean, you don't want to join or be part of a board or commission that you have absolutely no interest in because you're not going to do a very good job. You're not going to have much meaningful impact or input um, and you won't really get recognized. So choose one uh, th that is of interest to you, whether it's in education, public safety, economic development, the environment, what have you, or senior citizens or medical care. So just participate. And um, um, it is from that, you can learn about the political system. You can kind of understand who the various players are. You can then figure out where you want to go, whether you want to run for a school board or, or city council or something else or state legislature. Um, or be in an appointed position. Uh, as William indicated, uh, appointed positions can be just as impactful, um, uh, but obviously elected positions and certainly the executive branch, if you're able to be that person who makes the final decision, <clears throat> you can really have a great deal of influence. Let me just say that so many of the policies that I worked on um, benefited from my experience or, or I brought my immigrant experience and observations to the table. And that immigrant experience or understanding the trials and tribulations of immigrant families made me a better public servant um, and made me more sensitive to the issues of the Asian American community. Um, and, and certainly my training as a lawyer brought a different lens. And so <clears throat> each of us have different expertises that we can bring to the table. And while there are many people who could equally do the job, who could get elected, but no one else has the unique set of experiences and perspectives that each of us can bring to the table that can help shape the policies that are before us. Whether it's Alan in, in Rhode Island or William in Connecticut and, and you know, his experience in Connecticut and, and, and Allen in Rhode Island, um, uh, you know, those are not replaceable. They're not interchangeable. And so each of us has a unique opportunity to be at the table helping set the policies that affect all of us. And because we have faced so much hardship and discrimination from both Democrats and Republicans, quite frankly, you know, the, 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 the vitriol against Asian Americans and Chinese Americans today is coming from all sides of the political aisle, from the presidents uh, under President Trump to the members of Congress, uh, to the governors and, and members of the state legislature. So this is not, uh, you know, the discrimination that Asian Americans and Chinese Americans have faced, starting with the Chinese Exclusion Act, uh, limiting immigration to the United States, the alien land laws that prohibited Asians from even owning land um, uh, in the United States. And it wasn't repealed until almost the early 1950s in many states. I mean, we have continued to face these issues of being portrayed the perpetual foreigner by so many different political groups and businesses and corporations uh, all throughout our tenure here. And it's only with constant vigilance, having more people who are visible to the American public, can we change that perception of Asian Americans? And, and only by having more people at the table can our issues and even our simply our ethnicity and our contributions to America and our communities be taken more seriously. Yeah. So I'm just so proud of what Alan and, and William have done and many of our other AAPI elected officials, whether it's in San Francisco, New York City, Boston, Chicago, Florida, Texas, uh, state of Washington all over. Uh, we have much to be proud of, but we have much more work to do. Yeah. And so we've and got I, to get politically involved. And I think Gary's point about in the, at the end of the day, it has to overlap with something you care about. 
you know, it, it, if, if you don't care about it and you don't, and it doesn't have meaning for you, then it's not going to work. And just like this, uh, you know, this Asian American career schooling thing, I started it because it bothered me, right? And so I said, is there something I can do within my scope of power, or whatever, that would really help? But I want to end with one comment actually from something that Gary said, which I thought was really wonderful. I mean, I talked to him about when he ran for governor of Washington state, uh, you know, why he thought he won. And he said, there are two things. And Gary, I don't know if you remember this. And if I'm misquoting you, you can correct me. He said, one, I brought a different perspective because I was with an immigrant family. But the other was so many of the things that were a challenge for Asian Americans and Chinese Americans in the state of Washington were also challenges and concerns of the general voter population. And so I built bridges. You know, I didn't, I, I made sure I wasn't the enemy that I, but I was a common friend, right? And I remember that, Gary, you said that, it's because uh, if all I said was I'm, you know, Chinese American from a family, I, uh, all these voters wouldn't relate to, you know, to, 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 to things I cared about. So I think that's the other part of it, which is, yes, it's important that Asian Americans succeed in politics and so forth. But we have to stay connected with the rest of the world too, as, as we succeed other ethnic groups and the general population. So I want to just so again thank you. This has been a one as I thought, this is going to be one of my favorite webcasts, and I'm really really pleased uh, that uh, we got these two wonderful panelists. And Gary, thank you for your welcome comment, and I want to thank all of you for uh, uh, for for being on. But I also we want to thank the audience because we had a very big audience. Uh, and by the way, generally the number of people watching goes down over time. Uh, there has not been a single reduction in the number of people on. So you you obviously something that you said something that captured the imagination of the audience. So thank you very much. Thank you all, and thank, thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.